Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me okay. If you could hear me okay, just give me indication in the chat and we will quickly get started. Thank you. I can see a lot of people which are new and which are from previous batches. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here on a Saturday morning or evening for some of you. And my name is Ashish and I would help you today to understand a little bit about what the BESA program is and how the next 12 weeks would look like. A lot of volunteers with me, I will introduce them when the time comes, but welcome everyone. Just as a, a warm up activity, can you tell me which city you are joining from? So I'm, I'm joining from London. Anyone else joining from London or any other places, please let us know into the chat and we will quickly get started and make it interactive. Feel free to ask question. We have volunteers who are answering question into the chat. So feel free to ask as many questions as you have. We do not know every answer. We are not Google, but we'll try our best to answer as many questions as we can. So I can see people coming from Spain, Chennai, Indore. I belong to that place, Webho. So good to hear you from you. And then Mirpur, Pakistan, Finland, Stuttgart, Karachi, Singapore. Wow. Global audience. I like that and I can appreciate some of you are joining in a very odd time zone and we will try to ensure that you get the best return on the time you are investing here and energy you are putting into this. So Arizona, Oslo, Ghana, Cyprus, a joint from Pune, Ukraine. Yeah, we have a lot of people who have come from a program called IT skills for you, which is IT skills for Ukrainian. So welcome everyone. We also have people joining from AWS restart. We'll talk about that. So thanks for joining here from Ukraine, Islamabad, Chennai uh, means I would say now I know almost every part of the world people are joining. So thank you so much. Now quickly introducing the topic and the details about the program so that you are well aware about what we are going to do into this particular 12 weeks. I'll talk about program first. So BESA is a program which we have volunteered to start, which is called become a solution architect. And the intention is that we want to give people the skills required to become a solution architect. It is not just specific to AWS, though we will, will as a technology, we will talk about AWS, but it can be general principles also we will be focusing on, which can help you in any other type of journeys too. So that is BESA website. I'll share that link into chat or if any volunteer can put it into chat. So so that people can access it and then there is a FAQ page also where you should be able to get a lot of answers but yeah, if you have any questions further than that feel free to reach out to us now talking about who is there so uh, Ashish me and Parna Mehta she is not joining today but then we have Prasad who is also there and we have lots and lots of volunteers this time they would be joining and helping us in different types of things and some of us are today here so let me introduce everyone and then we will get started so i'm adding prasad to stage then i'm adding nicole then sharik is here richard is here and then kapil is also here so we all are trying to help you out as much as we can we do it in our free time so just be little uh, uh, aware about the fact that we may not be able to respond to every question but yeah we have good intention to help as much people as we can and as you will see into the session that some of us would come and present sessions or answer questions or take some uh, tracks as we move forward so this is the team if you can everyone quickly introduce yourself what is your role what you do on a day-to-day -day basis that would be really helpful for everyone anyone want to start yeah, yeah I can go start. ahead hello everyone prasad rahu here uh, currently i'm working as a principal solutions architect here at aws uh, specialized in microsoft workloads on aws and uh, aws community has helped me a lot very frankly and i see someone asking in the question uh, in the chat question that uh, why we are volunteering so it's just about you know like if we can help others also uh, in a way that aws community has helped us that was the whole intention that uh, you know me ashish and others when we couple of years uh, back, we started uh, BESA Become a Solutions Architect. Ashish will talk more about the program, about how we started, how it evolved over the years. This is the fifth batch that we are doing. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. I see a few people joining from US also. It must be insane early hours for you. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to you know, uh, add enough value uh, so that uh, yeah, it, it's worth giving away your sleep. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. 
Yeah, I'm Nicole. I'm a technical learning architect. I usually spend my days um, designing learning plans and paths for individuals and companies to achieve whatever they need to achieve, be it certification or getting ready for their next workload. So yeah, happy to be here. Kapil, if you want to speak up. Hi, everyone. My name is Kapil, and I'm senior solution architect with Amazon Ads. So I bring a different perspective. And uh, looking forward to work with you guys to, to, to make sure that you have every information needed to succeed in your role. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Colborn. I'm a technical instructor. I'm currently working as a technical instructor here at AWS. Um, I deliver a whole different range of courses to our uh, to customers who purchase training from AWS, you know, architecting, serverless, security topics, that kind of thing. I really enjoy talking to people about technology. Um, I actually switched careers in the year 2000 to, um, uh, to IT um, from doing something completely different. Back then, there weren't communities like this and programs like this. So I, at, back then, I would have been really, really grateful for something like this. So just to add a little bit more detail about why we volunteer for these kind of programs, well, specifically why I volunteer. So great to be here. Thank you. Shariq. Thank you. Hi, good morning and good evening and good afternoon, everybody. So yeah, I completely uh, echo the sentiment what Richard has just mentioned that we wish that if we had this kind of community when we started. So so yes, we kind of trying to um, give it back and help as much as we can. So I'm Sharik. I'm part of the same team as Ashish and Rich and uh, Nicole. So largely, we are part of the training and certification team. I'm based in London, so I'm part of the UK and Ireland team. Uh, I've been here previously in the other, uh, I think we had a session last time as well about interviewing and all. So this time I'm planning and kind of, you know, making sure that we, I will be more involved with the program and we'll see how it goes. So, so nice. Happy to have you all here. Thank you so much for volunteering your time on a Saturday. Now I'll, I'll quickly talk more on the program and I'll introduce more people when the time comes and we would have people joining in. I'm right now removing everyone from stage just to make a little bit more room onto the screen. But yeah, let's keep moving forward. Now, what are the other intentions we are looking for here? So idea here is that we want to ensure that you have all the required knowledge for becoming successful, as we mentioned before, too. So if I'm talking about why we are doing it, we are passionate about mentoring. We want to give back to community in our all learning. Somehow we have learned from a YouTube video or maybe by reading a blog post or maybe by talking to someone. So we want to make a formal mechanism of learning. And that's why we are volunteering and we are giving back to community. There is no hidden agenda. We are doing it from five years now or sorry, five batch now. So that's what the intention is when it would happen every Saturday 9 a.m. UK time. We are most of us are based in UK and that time suits us well and it aligns with Indian population too and probably European population too. So we will stick to 9 a.m. and sessions will be 90 minutes. We would give you some homework probably old school thing, but still very relevant that will help you in becoming the more getting the most out of this program. So don't shy away from doing the homework which we assign to you. OK, now how we will do it. We will do it the live session as we are doing right now, and these sessions will be recorded and available on YouTube. So you don't have to worry if you are able to uh, not not able to join one of the session and any resources we talk about. We will share it on Besa website and we have a LinkedIn group of 7500 people there. So feel free to put your question, put your answers there or respond to it. Do, try to shy away from basic hi, hello. Let's make it more technical. Let's make it more behavioral so that there is a value into the content you are adding into the group. So that's where we will share all the thing. How we would do it, I'll talk more on that, like how the quizzes will work, how assignments will work, what contents we will be discussing. So this how part I will be discussing a little bit more in detail in next section. How much cost wise there is no cost to you. If we ask you to perform some of the things or do a project, then that cost of AWS environment you have to manage. But to join the program or to learn from it, there is no cost associated on that. So this is just a basic introduction about the program. Now, as we are running it for specific audience, I want to highlight that who would benefit the most out of it. 
so people who are focused towards certification this batch is a certification batch so probably if you are talking about certification or if you want to get the most out of it so cloud practitioner first four weeks solution architect associate remaining eight weeks but it doesn't mean that if i already have this certification i won't get any value on that because we are including well architected track we will be also talking about behavioral track so probably all of these combined together would give you a good understanding and even if you know the technology everything here best would be that you go ahead and still attend it and share your knowledge with others it will also give you a good exposure to share knowledge and will also strengthen in your own confidence so even if you know all the technologies still be here help out others that would be really really appreciated this is just some glimpses of how we have operated so far so this is our fifth batch we started this in 2022 we have now 7,000 7, plus members on the LinkedIn group. We have around 4,700 plus subscriber and YouTube videos have been bought 83,000 plus times. People register for it. Like for this batch, we registered around 3,000 people, more than that. And you can see how many of us joined. So 10% people joined 340 right now. So that is completely fine. Previously, we had around 200 plus members joining. And people were able to obtain certification from previous batches. How we come to know? They just put this information into LinkedIn, tag us. So we know that, okay, these people have passed certification and they were kind enough to contribute towards BESA and were able to say that, hey, this program helped me a lot. We tried to do one-to-one -one mentoring also. So if you look here, we tried to give mentoring session of around 50 plus members. This is little limited in the bandwidth because we do not have too much time available on our hand. But if we have more volunteer this time, probably we can think about some methods for that. We have 20 plus guest speaker who come in coming from different background, different type of uh, experiences. So that's what we started with. And we were able to help people into getting into jobs also. So we are only highlighting people who have been placed into this FANG company. So six people were placed into AWS and one in Microsoft. This is what we have achieved so far, though a small number, but yeah, obviously the intention is not to have everyone succeed into a job, but if we can help them in some way in technically, behaviorally, or give them more confidence, that should be good enough to get started so this is what the intention is okay now some disclaimer so that there is no expectation mismatch so first thing that this is not a job guarantee program we are not promising that hey you attend 12 week and third week and 13th week there would be employers lined up to get you into a job no it's not going to happen it was never the case and it will not be the case this time also we are not giving any discount voucher this is not a aws sponsored program we are running it in our own capacity so we work for amazon and aws but it doesn't mean that we are officially speaking about those companies so we are not affiliating with them we shared our own in click case there is a conflicting information we talked about x and you think this is wrong you could go to documentation and get the most accurate picture in cloud technology the things are moving very fast so whatever i have told you today may not be that much relevant tomorrow concept won't change but some figures or numbers can change so just be aware about that and the program is run on best effort basis from all volunteers so if you ask a question if somebody does not respond it doesn't mean that we don't want to respond probably we are short on bandwidth or we have more important things to take care but if we not able to respond to you feel free to go forward and then ping us again probably sometime it gets buried into the number of messages we get so if you put it again in the forward we should be able to answer those questions all right so this is just some information about it now this is what a tentative agenda is looking like if you look here for the first few weeks we will be focusing on the cloud practitioner type of thing here now we will not be doing in a traditional powerpoint type of thing so we'll talk about that and then the remaining six eight weeks we will be focusing on solution architecture and idea is to give you the enough knowledge and the required skills so that you can become successful not just in passing certification but in answering interview questions also apart from that I would start with well architected track. So this is for people who are already having the certification and want to get to the next level. So we'll talk about well architected. We'll take a use case of a company and we'll see that how we can help that company in becoming a well architected. And then other if you see TBD, that means to be decided. We have kept this track open. Depending on the feedback we receive, we should be able to go ahead and 
cater to your needs maybe adjust something maybe provide some more contextual information if needed so feel free to let us know any feedback you have so that we can adjust these program and give you the most of it now behavioral track this will be 15 minute and there are multiple types of session we will be conducting i'll talk more on these two tracks but this is what a tentative agenda looks like again Things change very fast. So if we find out that people would get more value from X rather than Y, we may want to adjust it. And that will be purely based on the feedback we receive from all of you. So any feedback, good, bad, ugly is always, always welcome. Do not be shying away into providing any type of feedback. About certification track, we will focus on learning through discussion. So we'll try to talk about a scenario where a customer is present and a consultant is helping him or her out. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about exam preparation, online quizzes, more learning resources will be shared. We'll start with the cloud quest tournament also. We will have some guests coming up and for people who are regular, we would be hosting bonus sessions also, but that will be only for people who are regular. We don't want to invest our time into people who are having different commitment and cannot give time. So this bonus session will only for people who would be regular into this 12 week program, right? Talking about what behavioral track would include. So we will talk about career guidance. We will be talking about interview preparation there, all do's and don'ts of your career, building your network, Amazon leadership principles, and then guest session and bonus session will also be included into behavioral track. Talking a little bit more on the giveaway side. So we would be having some giveaway this time. One would be from Cloud Career Journey and another sponsor for our giveaway is VizLab. So I'll, I'll ask Prasad to talk about Cloud Career Journey so that he can explain you that what this is all about and why we have created this type of thing. So Prasad, over to you. Uh, thanks, Ashish. Uh, for those who do not know about the Cloud Career Journeys, it's a book that me and Ashish have co-authored. And... Uh, the book has come as a direct feedback from the previous BESA batches. Uh, one of the feedback that we have consistently received uh, is that there is a lot of technical material available. Like people can take a Udemy course uh, or there are technical videos uh, that are on YouTube that people can watch. But people are still confused about the path that they should be taking to navigate their cloud career. And that's what, you know, like Ashish mentioned uh, in the previous batches, we have been able to help few people get jobs. So we wanted to showcase the journeys of people who have been able to successfully transition from a completely different background to cloud are able to excel uh, in their cloud careers. And you know what resources they have used, uh, what uh, decisions they have made, uh, what challenges or roadblocks they have faced, and how did they overcome that? So that anyone who reads the book should be able to identify. So there are 16 people uh, featured in the book in different categories. So if anyone able to uh, identify themselves with at least one person or one category based on the career stage they are in, based on the background they are coming from, and based on their career aspirations. So that was the idea for the book. And uh, we would be giving away one uh, voucher for ebook every week uh, from the participants. It will be uh, randomly we'll be selecting from all the participants. So we will be uh, providing a link towards the data of the session where you'll be able to register uh, if you're joining us live. And we will be picking one person uh, randomly, and we'll be giving away the voucher for ebook. So this Makes is sense. the website. Yeah, Ashish, I think we should be sharing the website on the chat. I'll do that in a moment. Yeah, uh, or if I did that. So okay. if you want to get more information on that, there is a sign up for preview option. Nothing. You just need to provide your email, and you will get one chapter of the book. Just to understand that what the book has in it, what kind of what kind of things we have included. So always, please go ahead, get a sign up for preview. And then you should be able to get a copy of a, a limited one chapter, which will be giving you some idea on the flavor of the book, which it includes. Thank you, Prasad. All right. I'll keep moving forward and I'll talk more on the what is there. So talking uh, about this yeah. yeah, please. Yeah. So uh, someone even asked uh, on the chat as a question uh, about, you know, will there be a lab environment provided? So we'll not be able to provide lab environment to everyone, but this labs has been kind enough to give away their AWS sandbox access for three months. It has access to most of the AWS services, not all of them, but it should be good enough uh, for to get started with the hands-on labs. And we will be giving away 10 accesses uh, every week. And again, it will be randomly selected. But in case if you do not have a free tier AWS account, or if, if for some reason you are not able to have any account for 
kind of uh, you know doing your hands on labs feel free to reach feel free to reach out to me or ashish separately and we would be able to uh, you know like provide you that access otherwise every week 10 people who are regular and who will be signing up on the form that we will be sharing that if you are joining us live we will be picking up randomly 10 people and giving them access to his labs okay and what I realized, Prasad, I have eaten up a lot of time, so I'll, I'll be a little quick here. So sure. because we have technical track also coming up. So talking about giveaways here, for the first week, we are running a discount. So in case somebody wants to get it, 50% discount on the ebook. And we have another product called Starter Kit. Starter Kit gives you like six months access to this environment. And when you get these books, it includes free resources worth hundred of dollars. And in Starter Kit, it is more than that around $500 so that should give you good enough good enough time and expertise to get started practice on plural site practice on to AWS sandboxes and get training so a lot of content is there we will display the QR code at the very end weekly giveaways Prasad mentioned we will be giving up one ebook every week and will be 10 sandboxes that will give you access to three months and who are regular on the 12th week we will be also going with the Wizlab premium subscription which will be giving you more access to the content it will be around 12 months of subscription which will be given so that is all about the giveaway sections which we wanted to discuss so be engaged please make sure that you get the most out of the program and we thrive on feedback any feedback good or bad i don't say that i would be able to or we would be able to accommodate every feedback but if it is a general thing and we can do it obviously we should be able to try to go ahead and implement that more details if you need go to besa program page there are faqs check that and if you look at the website there are previous batch playlist so you could go ahead and check a idea or take an idea from this recorded youtube session that what you would be getting or what we would be have discussed so far and how we will move forward so that is all what we had to discuss as the program so i'll stop here I hope everything everyone has little more idea and I am sure there are still more questions. So feel free to reach out into chat. Feel free to reach out to us on LinkedIn afterwards and we'll try to answer as many as we can. And while you are here, make sure you are consistent. So even if you do not have time, I would say recommend everyone that you just take a pledge that even if I cannot pay full attention, I will at least log in for the whole 12 week. So as a confirmation from everyone, can you please type 12 into the chat as a confirmation that you would be logging in at least for the whole 12 weeks, even if you cannot practice all 12 weeks, but you would making a commitment here that we would continue to join 12 week consistency is the most important aspect of anything you do. If you do not feel consistent, then probably the output will not be the same you are expecting. So everyone. 12 as a number that your commitment to us that we would join and that would give us more energy to be focused that we have so many people relying on us how we can help them the most so make sure you are consistent into these 12 weeks all right yeah thank you everyone thank you so much and now i would hold you accountable i have everyone's name here so once you are not joining we would ping you and check what happened if you miss one or two session completely fine but watch recording and let us know if we can do something to make this program better thank you so much and now i am handing it over to sharik and nicole who would go ahead with the next aspect of this program adding you to stage now nicole and sharik Thank you. Over to you. And I would be in background. I would try to answer as many questions. And if you need my help, just shout out. Thank you. OK. Thank you. So let me quickly share my slides. Uh, so I'm not quite sure if it asks me to upload. But just a second. Yeah, take your time. And if you think, I think there is an option to share the whole screen rather than upload. So yeah, you would find that. Yeah, so that would be better. Okay. And all the content which we are sharing, we will try to make them available as soon as possible. Obviously, there is weekend. So we will take little time, but we will try to make that available as soon as possible. Okay, so good. So I hope you can see my screen now. I, I'll just add it, Nicole. Give me a minute. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, before uh, before you start, Nicole, just let me let me put the context, you know, to the to, to everybody what we have done here. Uh, so, folks, what we have done, we have made a small change from the last few uh, batches we had. 
um, instead of somebody talking on the screen and then taking your questions, what we have made a little bit of change. What we have done here is the, uh, that we are doing sort of role play. OK, uh, so in today's session, I will be doing the role play of a customer who has a requirement. Um, and Nicole will be the person who is, imagine, an AWS expert. She's a consultant and she will be answering. Imagine this is this as a boardroom discussion where I'm the customer and I have all the queries. Um, and and uh, Nicole is the expert who's going to answer all those questions. And probably somewhere in between, uh, maybe we'll see how it goes. And somewhere in between, we will switch the roles as well. We don't want to burden Nicole with everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so somewhere, whenever we feel like it, we'll simply switch the roles. And I will become the expert, and Nicole will become the customer. So we'll see how it goes. And on this, of course, what we would need from you is uh, the feedback as well, that do you like this format? Uh, because if you like it, we will continue with this format for the rest of the batch and probably next few cohorts. Uh, if not, probably we'll go through the standard model where one person teaches you with the whiteboard and everything. Um, right? So yeah, let's get going. OK. Yep. So uh, to get started and before we jump into our role play, um, we quickly wanted to define what cloud computing is. So sometimes when I'm on LinkedIn, there are people who try to explain cloud computing as a form of outsourcing. Please don't do this. Cloud is not outsourcing. Um, cloud or cloud computing is, as it says here, the on-demand delivery of IT resources over the internet, which means you can just get as much as you need for what you're doing. And when you're done, you give it back and you stop paying for it. It's as simple as that when you think about cloud computing. Obviously, once a company goes into the cloud, this definition can get a little bit different because there are different ways of paying for cloud. But when we talk about cloud, we mean it's basically a pay-as-you-go product rather than you having to pay everything up front for what you're trying to do and then have to keep on maintaining what you have bought in the past. Good. So I think um, we can get started. Sharik, what is your question? All right. Sure, Nicole. So I have a lot of questions, uh, but let's get started with the first one. Uh, is let me give you a little bit of background. So, so uh, we are a medium-sized company. We are approximately 500 plus employees, and we have um, we are into you know this medical domain where we are doing this clinical research sort of thing. Um, predominantly in North America and EMEA regions, but we do have customer base in, you know, uh, in, in APAC and other regions as well. And of course, we are in the phase where we are expanding um, and kind of very aggressively at the moment. Um, at the moment, we have approximately 1 million plus customer base uh, from different, and again, we have this B2B and B2C model. Um, at the moment, we have uh, a 10 different data centers in different parts of the world. So uh, we have it in New York, we have it in London, uh, San Francisco, Berlin, uh, Singapore, and a bunch of other places. So my first question, of course, would be to you is what I've heard uh, from, from my folks, my, my technical folks internally, my architects, that cloud is a, is a replacement for a data center. And if we move to cloud, eventually we will be able to get rid of our data centers and, and there are a lot of benefits of moving to cloud. So uh, what is your take on that? What, what are the benefits you have to offer to us as a company? Um, so, that would be my first question. Yeah, Please. so let me take you through it. So um, we have come up with a cloud value framework to describe what the benefits of the cloud are. So what we usually see is that most customers, when they decide to go to cloud, they do so because of cost savings. As I said earlier on um, already in the description, if you can just use what you really, really need and give it back when you don't need it, you can save some money because you don't have to pay for something running that isn't bringing any value to your company. So that's a typical focus. Um, but the other pieces that you will also kind of benefit from as you embark on your cloud journey are things like staff productivity, operational resilience, and business agility. And um, let me get some easier examples to explain um, to everyone what those are and how those differ from each other. And to make it a little bit less complicated, let's imagine we have a friend who is planning to open a restaurant. So their core business is to cook food, to serve the food to their customers and hope that the customers like it so much that they're coming back every day, ideally. 
So your core business is in need of some fresh produce. Obviously, if you are having a restaurant, you need food to, that you can prepare. You need ingredients. And you have two ways of supporting your core business um, in that respect. One option is you say, hmm, I'm going to go and get a farm as well. I'm going to have my own animals. I'm going to have my own fruit, my own veg, and all of that. Um, and the other option is you can say, yeah, don't want a farm. I get all the produce I need from the supermarket. So both options have their benefits and their disadvantages. So let's look at them. <clears throat> so obviously, when you think about, oh, I have my own farm, you could tell your customers in the restaurant, I know exactly where all the ingredients that I'm using for the food that you're consuming are coming from. I could say, I make sure I'm not using any chemicals. I make sure that I treat my animals really well. All of these things, and they could be added benefits when it comes to your reputation, for example. However, the farm has also the kind of um, downside that it is not your core business. You just have it to support your core business. So it means you have to pay for the farmland. You have to pay for additional staff that is taking care of your animals, that is taking care of um, your fields and your harvest. You need to make sure you have additional equipment they can use to um, fulfill all of these tasks. And then obviously you have food and vet bills for your animals to keep them happy and well fed. So there is an additional cost apart from just running the restaurant. When we then look at staff productivity for a farm, again, you have to make sure that you can prepare, grow and harvest. You need to take care of the cattle. You need to make sure that if you need more output, that you add more resources that can help with this additional output. So your product staff is just as productive um, as can be because it's physical labor. So every time you want to increase output, there is not much room for efficiency, right? Yes, you can buy more machinery, but you need more people to operate that. Then resilience of a farm. So there are natural disasters. There is weather that is not great. There are crop diseases. Um, there might be diseases when it comes to the livestock. Your staff might get ill, right? All of these things can impact your business and there's not much you can do about it. Um, and the impact on the farm then also is passed on to the impact onto the restaurant, right? You might not have all the produce that you need because of these things happening that you have no control of. And then last but not least, business agility. So what you can plant and harvest is dictated by the location you are in. Again, the weather, experience and availability of staff, right, and the time to harvest. Um, what does, that does is when your restaurant um, <clears throat> visitors say, oh, we really do like strawberries and it's December and you rely only on your farm, you might have a hard time in the UK at least to get fresh strawberries that really taste well because it's not the right time to grow them. So you can't really react to your customers' requirements because whatever you can provide is dictated by external factors, in this case, the climate. So let's look at the supermarket. So if our friend decides she will get all the produce she needs from a supermarket, she only needs to pay for the food that she is buying or the ingredients she's buying and maybe the transport and her restaurant staff. That's it. She doesn't need to take care of anyone who works on a farm because that's not um, her kind of responsibility in this case. When we look at staff productivity, they can focus exactly on what the end customer wants. And they want food. They want to be um, having nice meals. They want to be served. They want to be treated well. They might have a nice drink. And this is something everyone that you pay is focusing on. Nobody is focusing on feeding um, animals or harvesting crops. And then resilience. You don't care what the weather is when you buy your produce from the supermarket because the supermarkets will get produce from all over the world. If you need something, you will presumably get it, maybe at a higher price, but it will be available. And then agility. You can go to the supermarket every day. So if your customers 
tomorrow all go on to Instagram and see, oh, smoothie bowls are back in fashion, then you can go to the restaurant, get the ingredients you need to make the smoothie bowl, no matter how exotic the ingredient is. Well, when you have your farm, as we saw, if it's winter and everyone wants strawberries, it might be a problem. With a supermarket, it is not. Same for staffing. If you just need to look for staffing for your restaurant, you can adjust that. You can have temporary helpers for high season. You can have then just your fixed staff for all year round. On a farm, you can't just say, oh, you know, the demand is lower. Can you please go? Because you will not reduce the number of your animals and you still need to take care of the crop that can't be adjusted easily. So you can see there are some differences that you have to consider when making decision for one or the other option. So, but you might be thinking, Nicole, what has that to do with data centers? Um, actually, quite a bit. So if you have a business, if you're a bank, if you're a healthcare provider, if you are a university, whatever you are, your core business, unless you're a cloud service provider, is not data centers. You just have them to be able to provide your services, right? But in a data center, and you need multiple, um, obviously, as you said, you have 10 data centers, uh, Sharik, uh -huh. for making sure that if something happens to one data center, your business is still up and running in the other data center. That means you presumably pay a lot of people to just keep the lights on. You pay electricity bills. You need to have to look out for cooling. And if something breaks, you have to buy it. And usually if someone in your team comes to you and says, I have this amazing idea, chances are they will also ask you for a large amount of money to invest up front to buy the infrastructure components they might need, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So <clears throat> just a question to you. Last time that happened that someone had a super great idea and said, hey, Sharik, I need some money. I need to buy all these infrastructure um, pieces to try out my idea uh -huh. was this idea really a valuable one or did it happen that you know they failed potentially and now you have all this leftover capacity in your data center um oh yes i mean we don't have the situation of leftover capacity but we are always uh, struggling with more to, to have more capacity to try out new ideas um, so that's always a problem for us because, because you know, um, when we talk about the scalability aspect of data centers, um, it's not something where we can do it overnight, right? So there is a whole process of um, first getting approvals, then procurement, uh, the vendors ship those things to us. And again, these are multiple vendors we are talking about, not just one company. Um, which country, which city we are talking about the data center, that matters a lot there. Um, and once that is done, it's not over because then we are talking about the racking, cabling, stacking, all of those things. Then we add the virtualization layer on top of it. So easily I'm talking about if let's say some of our, let's say one team comes and they say, okay, we need this much of extra capacity. Um, and if we have to go through this whole process, I'm talking probably three to six months uh, of yeah. the turnaround time. Um, if, if everything goes smoothly, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it, it basically means you can't react instantly to it simply because there's so many other components involved that, that you have right. no control That's over, right? And that is cannot. very very similar to what we saw in the with the farm example, right? There are lots right. of components you can't control. Mm -hmm. So, but let's look at the cloud, our supermarket here. Mm -hmm. So if your um, teams come to you and say, Sharik, I have this amazing idea. These are all these things that I need, and ideally I want them now. In the cloud, that is possible because we have a large amount of different services and infrastructure pieces that you can just take to uh -huh. try things out, and then you give them back if you fail. And you will fail at a lower cost because there is no need to buy a server. You can just go into your cloud account, you just kind of spin up an EC2 instance, a virtual server if you need one. Whatever you need, you can choose from many different ones. Mm -hmm. Try out what you want to try out. If you succeed, great, then you can maybe scale. Um, and if you don't, you have failed at a very low cost and very quickly as well, right? Because time to market or time to failure um, is also very important to businesses because you want to be first to market, ideally, and not last to market. 
And you can wow. see easily, you can also change <clears throat> directions, right? So in the beginning, you might say, oh, yeah, we just build how we would build in our data center just with cloud resources. And that's perfectly fine to begin with. But over time, you might also experiment with new services you can find in the cloud, which enable you to do things differently and might bring additional benefits in the future. So you have also an easier way to test if how you build it is the best way to build your solution over time. But we will look into this um, at a later stage, potentially. But I hope this kind of illustrated a little bit why cloud can bring many benefits for your business. Um, also oh, yes. with the help oh, of the farm mm -hmm. supermarket. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but what I got from you is that if, let's say, I have a specific, let's say, some extra capacity requirement in terms of some compute, some storage, probably a few yeah. databases, uh, mm -hmm. you are telling me I can go ahead, get away immediately, uh, get started immediately, and use it for a week, and then I go ahead and terminate everything if I don't need, and you're not going to ask me any questions. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly, wow. exactly. You just, you don't even have to speak to me if you don't want to, right? Because wow. you can just help yourself in your AWS mm. account to whatever you need. Obviously, if you don't want your employees to just mm -hmm. go completely out and uh, take whatever they can find, you can limit what is available to them in a sandbox environment, right? But yes, mm. everything you can possibly need and also need for experimentation is available. And if you say that's not for me, you can give it back. And you just literally click a button, say delete, confirm or terminate, whatever it is, and it's gone. Wonderful, wonderful, very interesting. Um, okay, so on that note, I have one more question, like, you know, continuation to that. Um, as you would know, because we are running data centers, we are into multiple locations, we are a company who's catering to multiple geographies and multiple customers mm -hmm. of course we have to we have to comply with a lot of um, regulations and when i say regulations think gdpr think uh, pci think probably hipaa fisma those kind of things mm -hmm. right um, and of course we have different regulations in us we have different regulations in european countries and of course apac has their own india singapore all these countries they have their own regulations and governing bodies Mm -hmm. And we have to put a lot of effort into that. And I guess you would know about that if you have done that, right? So it's 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 not an easy thing to do. How does AWS help me there? Because you are telling you have different uh, places. I mean, basically what I want to understand is, is where my data is going uh, mm -hmm. to be to get started with. Um, so, I mean, at the moment you say cloud, but cloud is, where is cloud? Uh, can, you, can you elaborate on that, please? Yes, sure. So, uh, the global infrastructure for AWS is split up in into different terms, you could uh -huh. say, right? Um, and when we talk about the physical location, to your point, if you say, oh, I have to comply with certain rules and this data needs to be um, in the UK or it needs to stay in Germany or it needs to st stay in the US, uh -huh. you need to make sure that the physical location of your cloud is in those regions. So we call it region. A physical location for AWS is a region. Uh -huh. So, and you can choose this region again in your AWS account, um, depending on what your requirement is for the workload and the data this workload is using. And potentially also which one is closest to your customers because you don't want them to go around the world before they reach their website, right? Um, but each region, uh, contains at least three availability zones. So availability zones <clears throat> are basically physical data centers. So at least one per availability zone. Mo most of the times, multiple data centers per availability zones. And those um, availability zones um, or those data centers in those are independent data centers that are completely redundant from their other data centers in those uh, regions. And why do we do that? So we make sure that our customers have the ability to architect for failure. So when anyone who has seen Werner Vogels on stage at some point during reInvent will presumably have heard everything is failing all the time. So you need to architect and build for failure. Mm -hmm. And this kind of availability zone setup in each region allows you to do so because you can have your workloads spread across those different availability zones. So if disaster strikes, 
and one availability zone goes down, you have two others that at least two others that will take over. So there is no disruption to your business. Okay. Good. And then the last one. Okay, in that last Oh, yeah. internet, Nicole, sorry. Um, I, I hear my, my data center folks uh, using this term a lot when you said high availability. You know, they use this term called single point of failure, right? So mm -hmm. basically, when we design data centers or any of the architectures, the, the main aim is to not to have a single point of failure. So mm -hmm. does AWS help me in that, that way? Like, you know, how does it work uh, on it, AWS? Exactly. So the single point of failure is exactly what is kind of um, being aimed at with the availability zones. So oh. usually if you have one or two data centers, right? I mean, two data centers is better than one, obviously, but usually you have your workload running in one data center and then potentially as a backup in the second one. So, but in the availability zones, you could even spread your workloads across three or more data centers or availability zones, um, depending on the setup and you would have automatic failover as well. You can even, and I'm kind of talking maybe a little bit too early about it, but if you have, for example, use cases where, I don't know, a particular holiday gets really, really busy for your business, you could make sure that your infrastructure automatically scales out also across different availability zones to keep up with the demand that is put on it in that particular time period. But we can come to that later. That would be a dream because we had a big problem during our last marketing event. We were expecting uh, double the number of customers, but suddenly we had 5x customers and we could not cope up. We had uh, site crashing multiple times in multiple locations. So yes, that would be a dream. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one more question on that. Uh, when you mention about these you know, um, availability zones and regions, uh, one thing, again, this would be probably, we'll talk about this maybe sometime later on as well, mm -hmm. but I'm assuming at this point is that when we talk about, say, for example, uh, backup solutions, replications, disaster mm -hmm. recovery, because again, those are very integral part of when you design an architecture when you, because, um, uh, you know, you mm -hmm. have to think about all those things, whether it is for your business perspective or whether uh, complying with um, different regulations. So I'm assuming it's again, either, um, Amazon or AWS is going to help me somehow uh, with the service features or mm -hmm. they help me design. You're going to help me design so that I can put this the way I design in our data centers. I can do that in our um, um, in, in it, using AWS services as well. Is that the right assumption? Yes. So we do have the well-architected framework, which helps you guide your teams to do the right things. So Perfect. architecting for high high availability and full to tolerance being operational efficient and all these kind of things mm -hmm. um, but we also have specific services that help you with your backups that help you to store your backups in places that are global in our world mm -hmm. um, wow. so that things Wonderful. do not get lost right mm -hmm. um, so there are many many things you can do um, to help keep your business safe and up and mm -hmm. running um, mm -hmm. And it depends how much automation you want and how much you want your people to do that manually. But there are different ways of going about it. And we will learn about those services and the ways how to do it in the next coming um, sessions as well. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Um, all right. So shall we move on to the next question? Uh, as I said, I have a lot of questions for you, but I'll stick yeah. to maybe five or six for today's session. Yeah. I um, the next question I have is, is uh, you know, we have these, uh, you know, different geographies. And and as I said earlier as well, that, you know, we have customers based in different worlds. How do we make sure? I think you have that on your screen as well. I was actually talking about content delivery network, CDN, mm -hmm. you know, to make sure that wherever my user base is, they are getting the best possible um, latency or the lowest possible latency. So you have something there? Yes, we have um, multiple pieces there. So if um, sometimes we have customers who say, we do need to do some data processing, but it can only have very, very little latency. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, for, for example, if you have your business in Finland, All right. um, Stockholm might not be close enough, right? And for those cases, we have in some um, locations, something we call local zone. Local zones are data centers that have a very limited number of services. So usually everything that belongs in the world of EC2 is available there. But the idea is for those to just be used to do those data processing tasks 
with very low latency and if needed they can connect to the services that are in their parent region which for Finland would be the Stockholm region mm -hmm. so that's one piece that is available in select locations the other piece and it goes more to the content delivery part is edge location so we have some something called CloudFront so if you have customers like I would be very impatient <laughs> um, and you would have me go around the world to get to the website that I'm trying to access, I would not be very happy, even if it's just five seconds. That's um, a perfect but... <laughs> recipe to do <run> the customer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, you know, if you want to keep me happy and want to make sure there is no latency, you need to try to bring it closer to me. So okay. if there is a region that is closer to me or very close to me, that's great. You could just put things also into this region, but sometimes there is not. And then you can use something called edge location, which is a point of presence that is closer to the end user and you can cache content there. So I will mm -hmm. be rooted to this place rather than halfway around the planet to consume what I like to consume. Okay, so let me let me ask you this now. So you mentioned about regions, you mentioned about uh, availability zones. Uh, mm -hmm. So the edge locations, are they part of these regions and availability zones or are they a separate entity, uh, especially designed for these edge, edge um, services or, or how are they designed? Are they separate together? What exactly they, is the picture? They are separate. They are separate points of presence um, okay. that we have designed in multiple locations. So that's why I think as of recently, there are about 660 points of presence that we have. Wow. all over the planet that can mm -hmm. be used and you can directly connect from them from your AWS console and then use them to cache whatever you would like to cache to bring it closer to your end user. Wonderful. I mean, when you said about point of presence, I was wondering in my head that um, do you have do you have 100 plus data, data centers to take care of that? And you mentioned 650 plus, so. <laughs> 660 incredible. plus, yeah. 660 plus, exactly. This, that's like great news. So pretty much the whole world is covered, I can assume there, right? So yeah, most of the pretty. geographies are um, covered there. Exactly. Wonderful. And it's also always good to keep an eye on our um, global infrastructure website, because whenever mm -hmm. we announce new regions, new points of presence, um, mm -hmm. or kind of new services like the local zones, they're relatively new service compared to the others. Um, mm -hmm. You will find out there first. So it's a yeah, good idea to just, you know, keep it bookmarked, check back from time to time to see what is new and what is available. Okay, okay. So I see there's one link in the chat window mm -hmm. as well that about the global infrastructure. So probably um, we can go and check. That's where we will get all the information about um, where is the, like, you know, at the moment, how many regions and availability zones and um, points of presence uh, AWS has. Perfect, mm -hmm. perfect. Uh, so yeah, I get the picture. We have uh, data centers all across the world. AWS calls them availability zones and mm -hmm. regions, uh, of course, for to design high, highly available and fault tolerant applications. For CDN, we have um, edge locations. If you want to run our um, you know, workloads locally or very close to our customers. We have local zones. Um, what is this outpost? Uh, I, I'm not sure if we talked about that. You have yeah. this on the screen. Yeah. Yes. So sometimes we have customers who need even lower latency than local zones um, or want oh, to right. have AWS services or a select number of those services in their data center. So in this case, AWS can provide AWS outpost, which will live in your data center um, and you can connect it there and use some of the services aw offers in their regions on this outpost um, All right. which obviously gives you ultra low latency because it is literally next door to your other servers in your data center if you need to hmm, very interesting in fact that brings me to one more question um we had this discussion going on internally, like, you know, when we were planning for this cloud strategy, what we should move and what we should not move. So we have this situation, uh, just want to run this by you, uh, is that we, we, what we can foresee is that we probably would not be able to move everything over to AWS. So eventually, probably a few years down the line, we will have a situation where we want to run few things continue to run on our data centers, mm -hmm. um, specific geographies, and then we want to run, let's say, 60, 70% of the workloads 
um, from AWS. And we, of course, want to make sure that they can talk to each other. So we will have some components on-prem, some components AWS. Would you support that or would you ask us to move everything to AWS? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we, we support this. So you can have a hybrid setup with AWS. We have services. Thank you. I was looking for that term. Hybrid yes, is what hybrid. came up multiple times. Perfect. Thank you for that. <laughs> exactly. So in, there are services, for example, like Direct Connect, you can use to connect your cloud environment to your data center without it crossing the public internet. So there are ways to do so and architect it. And again, your, your teams will learn about how to do it and the best practices to make sure that everything is safe, secure, and obviously also high available. Wonderful. So again, I got this from your discussion. You are telling me that if let's say I use AWS region in Stockholm and probably some region in Singapore, and if I have to make these two components talk, I don't need to go through the internet necessarily. I can make them talk through some private channel without going over the internet. Exactly. If you have a data center, one of your data centers that needs to talk to the cloud and you don't uh -huh. want it to go over the public internet for whatever reason, you can make those two talk over a dedicated line, so to speak. Wow. And either we can help you directly with it in some cases, or you would go to our one of our partners that is mm -hmm. helping us with that setup. Right. And that magic word is direct connect you mentioned. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Right, wonderful, wonderful, great news. Um, uh, all right, so uh, let's move on to something more specific I had in mind. I was actually talking about that. So when we talk about the workloads, um, we have these um, different kinds of workloads. Of course, what you need is to some place to run those workloads, and and you would know, right? So I think um, pretty much any company in the world. So we have these physical machines, virtual machines. Um, so, of course, physical machines we have on the data centers, but we typically work on the virtual machine based architectures. A um, lot of our work has been put on containers. I'm not sure if you are familiar with that, uh, which is like containerized workloads, we call them. So if you have, uh, if you're familiar with the words like Docker, Kubernetes, mm -hmm. um, we are running those things on, on you know, in our um, um, data centers at the moment. Um, and um, yeah, I've actually heard about this one more thing called something about um, serverless. Probably we'll talk about that later on. Yes. Let's focus on this. So I have, uh, we have workloads all across in our different data centers in, at the moment, which, is, which are virtualized on like, you know, um, uh, using the hypervisors. So virtual machines, as we call them. Mm -hmm. And we have containerized workloads. Um, do you support both or one of them? Or how does it work exactly? Yes. What, what options I have on AWS? So we support quite a bit. Oh, let me skip to this one and come back to the evolution later on. Okay. So if you just to get started, want to basically lift and shift or copy and paste what you have now into your, in your data center to AWS, you can do mm -hmm. so. We have the instance types that you need to do um, just that. If you have containers, that you want to move to AWS, you can do so too. We support Docker and Kubernetes. We also have services that help you manage those two. And then obviously, as you move further down the line on your uh, cloud journey, you might even say, why do I even want to go with servers? Maybe I just get rid of them. I don't want to manage them and we move to serverless. But before we dive deeper into those three categories, I would say I hand over to you, Sharik, to kind of, um, guide us a bit through the evolution of compute, because some of you in the audience have just heard EC2 instances, oh. containers, and serverless, yeah. but how does this hang together? So I hand over to the expert. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. So yeah, let me let me just uh, take over and kind of uh, give some technical details about, about uh, what goes on behind the scenes. So of course, we all would know. Uh, Nicole, would you mind continuing sharing your screen? Uh, I'll take oh, over when I need that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's still, you can still see my screen. Uh, I can, I can. Okay, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Or give me a second, actually. Let me, mm -hmm. um, hold on, just give me one second. Yeah, so for the, for the um, audience who are logged in, so what we are doing essentially at the moment is, is reversing the roles. So Nicole is going to be the uh, customer and, uh, uh, I'm going to be the the 
uh, the expert from AWS now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, let me let me share my screen. I have the uh, slide deck. Let me go ahead and do that. Okay. Wait one second. So then let me stop sharing. So, thank you, Ashish. Um, all right, so what we have here is this evolution of compute. And anybody who has been uh, an old person like me in the industry for about 20 years or more, you probably have seen this transition happening, uh, you know, uh, probably, and you have worked on a lot of these things. So, of course, what we had back in the day when we talk about, you know, uh, if we discuss about, let's say, uh, I don't know, like pretty much all the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, pretty much till 2000, 2001, 2002, we had, this was the only option we had, uh, the physical machines, right? So we had these big data centers and giant, all these racks and everything. We have we, we had these big uh, uh, stacks of servers which we used to work. Sometime, I think this was 2001, 2002, when, um, you know, we had these new type of softwares coming in called hypervisors. Uh, put in the chat window if you are uh, if you are aware of any of the hypervisors, which one you have worked on. I would be very cu curious to know. Uh, just to give you my background, I have uh, worked extensively in a data center environment and you know working in on these virtualization technologies before moving uh, doing this transition to uh, to DevOps and cloud. And I still kind of you know think of myself as a more of an infrastructure guy. <laughs> uh, so virtual machine uh, was the next transition, and if you remember, this was predominantly all the way from two thousand one to uh, to the whole the first uh, decade of two thousands, and then this was around two thousand thirteen, if I'm not wrong. Uh, there was this gentleman called Solomon Hikes who created this software called Docker. You probably would recognize the logo as well. Um, he created this software called Docker and, you know, kind of gave it to the world that, okay, go ahead. I have created this, test it out, check it out, what exactly it is, and let me know, um, you know, how does it look like? And as they say, uh, it's been a decade and the rest is history. You know, I always quote this thing, like, you know, if I would have told you in 2013, 14, around that time, that eventually we will be running uh, all of the our production workloads using containers, you would have literally laughed at me. <laughs> uh, but today we are doing that. We are actually doing that. Most of the companies, when you talk about when you, I mean, all of you are from working in different capacities in different companies, um, you would kind of uh, attest to that fact that we uh, have heavy workloads moving on to containers, right? And then in the last six, seven years, I would say, of course, serverless, you see that logo that is for AWS Lambda. We'll talk about that service probably briefly today. Uh, that was first introduced in 2014, if I'm not wrong. Uh, some, some, some audience in the panel, please correct me if I'm wrong there. But it was 2014, 15, around that time. Uh, but within a year or so, 2016 onwards, people started picking it up. And uh, then, you know, it became very, very popular in a short span of time. We have this. We'll talk about that, actually. We'll, that, that we will uh, probably touch base upon towards the end. So this has been the compute evolution in the last, like I would say, 30, 40 years. And of course, as everything else in the IT industry, this was a bit slow uh, towards the left. But as we move over here to the right, it has been faster and faster and faster. <laughs> um, so that is there. So coming back to now our option. So you might be wondering, like, you know, when I was the customer, uh, I had this question to Nicole that do we have these options on AWS? And the answer is definitely a big emphatic yes. We do have when you want to work the um, when you want to work on the instances, you have this option called EC2 instances, which are nothing but technically they are virtual machines, um, and they do need a hypervisor. Um, again, this has been you know whenever I uh, teach any classes, whenever I talk about AWS, uh, we we have this question coming up from the audience like, what's the hypervisor? Uh, you know, uh, AWS or Amazon uses. Let me know. Um, what do you think is the hypervisor we are using? And then I'll tell you uh, maybe in a minute or so. <laughs> so we have this EC2 instances, uh, which is technically, as I said, they are virtual machines. And any workload you have at the moment on your virtual machines in the data centers, you actually um, can simply do a lift and shift or you can change that. And I think that needless to say that we have different kinds and different uh, sizes of virtual machines. So we have virtual machines which are giving you probably one gig of RAM, half a gig of vCPUs, very small instances, uh, to instances which are giving you memory in um, terabytes, 
right? So you heard that right, terabytes memory. <laughs> okay, so we have those those type those size of instances as well, uh, huge size of instances, and of course, you can utilize all of them, and they are actually um, you know available to you pretty much at the click of a button. When it comes to containers, we have again services. We'll dive into them in just a moment. Uh, we have these two services predominantly, um, ECS and EKS. We'll talk about them, and then we have this um, serverless architecture, where uh, you know um, you can. Uh, we have this concept of modern applications. Uh, anybody familiar with the? Um, let me let me put this. Uh, let me know what do you think this is. Give me the full form there in the chat window. Um, that is actually, um, I mean, you can directly relate this to, uh, to, to, you know, uh, to, to serverless here, right? So when you work with EDA, essentially you are working with serverless and vice versa. Of course, the experts will say not that's not always the case, which is true. Technically, that is true. Um, uh, but yes, pretty much most of the times when you work with you know serverless, you are actually working with EDA. Uh, yes, thank you so much. I see all those responses. Event-driven architecture, absolutely. That is uh, the one I was talking about. So let's let's kind of uh, talk about. So yeah, coming back to the EC2 instances, the compute instances, we do have a number of different types here. Um, on demand, and we have savings plans. This is where you know you if if you had the question that uh, do you have any sort of um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, if I was a customer, uh, or probably Nicole, um, would you like to uh, yes. stop me and ask any question there? Yes. Sure. So um, obviously, I know already that I will have to bring a lot to AWS. And I have a good idea of how many servers we have running in our data center. Mm -hmm. So do you have any loyalty programs or discounts if I say I commit to using I don't know, 100 servers for a year or two or three, because we do know that we can't modernize everything just like tomorrow. So some things will keep on running. So do you help me with that? Or will I have to just live with the pay as you go pricing? Well, we have uh, you covered there, uh, Nicole, uh, definitely. Uh, and and uh, we do have these programs. Of course, we have something called EDPs, like Enterprise mm -hmm. Discount Programs. I guess we have Kapil on the call, who is a solution architect. So he will have much better understanding than me, because he would be working on this uh, with his customers on a daily basis. So probably he can pitch in later and talk more about that. But from the EC2 perspective, if I purely talk about the virtual machine. So let's say you mm -hmm. said like you 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 know the numbers. Give me a number. What is the number you are talking about? Uh, yeah, I think it's it's a hundred plus servers, maybe a hundred two. Who knows? But I think okay. there are a hundred at least that will be running twenty four seven for a year or more. All right. So let's say we have workload X, and you are running those hundred machines all the time. Hundred servers. They have some specific capacity, um, and you are working on those, and you are keeping them, as you said, twenty four by seven running. Mm -hmm. So then you don't need this on-demand plan. So this was the first one. When you go ahead and go with all the default values, that is the instance type you're going to work with, right? So that is basically um, the type where no questions asked. You know, <laughs> you create the instance whenever you want. You run the workload. It could be for five hours. It could be for five days, five months, whatever. And once you're done, when you don't need the instance, just go ahead and terminate that instance. And again, you will be it, there will be a calculation again automatically behind the scenes. And you will be when you get the bill, you will see that okay, this is for uh, those five days or five hours. This is the instance type, and this is the amount of bill you have to pay. This will be a proper itemized bill which you get at the end of the month. <laughs> But then, as you mentioned, that you know that you are going to run those 100 instances 24 by 7 for the foreseeable future. In that case, we give you these options. We have these um, discount plans, if you will, um, called savings plans, where when you commit to us, we call them commitment-based uh, plans. Uh, what happens when you say that, OK, I'm going to run um, let's say 100 M5 extra large instance, and I want to, I don't see it stopping for the next one year um, or a three years. I want to keep it running. Because you you will or you have made that commitment to us, we will give you uh, special discounts because of that commitment. And that can go up to 72% um, based on, again, geography, the availability zone, what is the instance type you have chosen. There are multiple factors, but it can go up to 70 72%. 
Um, again, for some instances, it could be 50%, 60%. So it gives you straight away um, that discount over your on-demand pricing. So imagine uh, if your bill, um, just for compute, just for running virtual machines, if this was $10,000 a month, um, we are straight away talking about taking away $4,000, $5,000 from there, uh, mm -hmm. straight away. So that's a huge discount. And again, more, most importantly, that is not any compromise in terms of the technical capability of that instance. If it is an M5 large instance, it is an M5 large instance, whether it is on demand or savings plans, mm -hmm. doesn't make a difference. Okay. Right? And just one more question. So obviously I have workloads that will be running all the time, but my team has now started to get into analytics. They said, Nicole, we have so much data, but we're not doing anything with it. Imagine if we just analyze it and do something with it. I think it's amazing, but I don't understand these things really. So in this case, because I assume analytics is a little bit less predictable than you know my application that is nicely running there. So would mm -hmm. I then for my analytics workloads go for an on-demand instance? Mm -hmm. Or would you say okay, they're see. still okay for a savings plan or reserved instance? Um, as you said, uh, uh, Nicole, that you cannot predict, so probably that would not be a good idea. I mean, you cannot tell us that, okay, we are going to use these 100 instances when you're not sure. On demand is definitely an option, but how about if I give you an even better option, right? So because of this workload, so because of these, um, uh, again, you gave an example of analytics. This could be for analytics. This could be for some big data workloads. This could be some... Uh, I don't know, some testing scenarios, people who are in DevOps, they, they run these CI CD pipelines all the time. Um, and those are, you know, you can run them. The idea is that you have a workload which is flexible enough to be run whenever you want, whenever you have the capacity. Mm -hmm. You don't have to keep it running all the time. When you have those kind of workloads, those capacities, we have this option called EC2 spot instances. Mm -hmm. And as you can see on, on the screen, it gives you up to 90% of discounts over on-demand pricing. Mm -hmm. so, so imagine this, if an on-demand uh, instance was costing you probably $1 an hour, just mm -hmm. a fictitious number there, this is the same instance, technically the same instance with same capacity might cost you hardly maybe 15 cents or mm -hmm. 20 cents, like, you know, 70, 80, up to 90% uh, discount it can give you, depending again on what geography, which AZ, um, um, what type of instance. There are multiple factors uh, which 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 goes into you know this thing, but mm -hmm. but they give you that kind of distance. The more important thing here is that like you know there are certain sort of caveats because uh, I mean we'll not go into the details in today's class, but um, uh, there is this thing called. Uh, whenever we need, why are we calling this temporary? Why we're calling this like, you know, that it is good for only state less workloads is because of the fact that these instances can be taken away, can be reclaimed uh, back from the customers. Uh, and because of that, uh, I mean, generally, I put it this way uh, to our customers, don't put your databases on on spot instances right, <laughs> right. So, okay. but when you have containerized workloads as a, as you give the example uh, you know some analytics workload which needs to be run for 15 minutes 20 minutes uh, mm -hmm. something like that uh, then go ahead by all means uh, you can use spot instances and you don't lose anything in terms of the capabilities but you mm -hmm. gain in terms of the pricing uh, which is as okay. i said it's up to 90% which is like um, amazing um right yeah. as the so i yeah. i'm i'm amazed because they you know didn't sound very cheap to me to begin with when they talked to me but that that's very comforting comforting to be actually um I, I i'm surprised i'm quite shocked because my instances definitely don't get a discount from the vendor when i order them uh -huh. um but yeah so coming back to this other piece i you know the company is also using containers and we're coming back now to um the, the Kubernetes part, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we do this? So I understand when I have something on my server, my team can just magically lift and shift it into the cloud and it will be happy there. Obviously it's not as easy, right? But for me as a non-technical person, it's as easy as this. So, but do we do the same with the container? So do we just lift our Kubernetes over to AWS? And do you have some, some things that can help us manage our Kubernetes clusters in the cloud. And they're also mm -hmm. talking about Docker recently. Um, so I'm not sure why they are talking about both now, but
But mm -hmm. as far as I understood from my teams, we need an option to be flexible. Some might prefer Docker over Kubernetes, maybe because they are more familiar with it. So is there anything for us that I can take back to the team and say? Sure thing, yeah. sure thing. We actually have a number of things there. Um, when we talk about containers, just like um, anywhere else, we give you multiple options. See, the idea, I mean, sometimes, you know, I get this uh, feedback from customers that, um, like, you know, you have too many options. You, you're confusing me. <laughs> uh, it's not to confuse you. It's to give you all the possible options depending on your workload. Now, specifically talking about containers, when you, when you talk to your container experts in your team, you would find um, that you have... Uh, two major kinds of workloads in fact in fact let me ask let me kind of take a step back here mm -hmm. i'll probably come over here and uh, you can see my screen right yeah. yeah let me go ahead and ask this question to the audience to everybody you must have heard of this term docker and you must have heard of this term called kubernetes right mm -hmm. um so again no need to answer if you want definitely but just think about it in your head what do you think when when this comes to your mind when you when you see this this statement docker versus kubernetes what do you think i'll give you like four or five seconds and then i will um talk what what i mean there i will i will tell you in just a second okay so when we talk about again why i brought this up because this is again very confusing for a lot of people especially who are not very comfortable with containers who have not been working with containers there um people think that they can use docker and kubernetes you know interchangeably uh, but let me kind of uh, take a step back and, and give you sort of the big picture when we talk about containers or containerizations and this is this should be helpful for anybody who is working in an individual capacity and if you're having a boardroom discussion, if you are a you know C-level person, if you're a director, it should be helpful for every single person in this room, uh, if you're not familiar already. So when we talk about containers, the container, the big container world, we have two major kinds of softwares, okay? We have something called container runtimes, okay? Um, and this is where you have the likes of Docker, but as you can imagine, Docker is not the only one. Docker happens to be the most popular software there. Uh, it's typically the first one where it all started in terms of the commercialization and um, um, you know making it easy for the customers. Um, another important fact, by the way, fun fact, people think that Docker or containers started uh, in 2013 when Docker was first introduced. But containerization-like technologies um has been there since late 70s right so all the big companies of of that era they had worked with if you talk about unix and linux platforms the the big ones i'm talking like you know the, the if you have heard of something called uh solaris if you're familiar with hpux if you're familiar with aix uh they had these container like environment for a very long time what Docker did that made it very easy for each and every person to start working on containers that make it made it you know uh, commoditize the technology so to speak. Anyways, so container runtimes we have Docker that's the first one as the most popular one, but you might have heard uh, of the software called Cryo. You might have heard of Containerd, which is which is quite popular in recent times. In fact, a lot of the you know workloads are running Containerd at the moment. We have something called Rocket. Uh, there is this new one called uh, Portman, which I believe from Red Hat. So these are the softwares which let you create containers. So if I'm a developer, let's say I want to work on a containerized application or I have a standard application, I want to containerize that. I will go ahead and install Docker on my laptop and I will start kind of, you know, playing around with the technology. I'll see how it works. I'll start packaging and all those things. But when we talk about containers, uh, when we talk about moving or working on containerized technologies and moving our workloads to production, we are talking about literally uh, not hundreds, but thousands of containers and probably tens of thousands, in some cases, millions of containers. So obviously, it's not humanly possible for us uh, to manage those. I mean, people who are coming in from the virtual machine world, I mean, I remember 10 years back, um, if you needed something, you would go to uh, a machine, you will SSH into that machine, or you will RDP into that machine. You will do your thing and you will come out of it, which is, as I said, humanly not possible anymore when you have hundreds and thousands of containers to work with. That's where 
we have the second category of software, which we call as container orchestration engines. And I guess you would have you would have guessed it already by now that this is where the most famous name is Kubernetes. At the moment, if you look at the industry, if you are in the technology domain, you would know that Kubernetes, like everybody is talking about that. Um, and and uh, probably uh, most of you have the Kubernetes uh, workloads running over there, right? So you have that. So once again, Kubernetes is the, it's officially the most popular, um, you know, the orchestration platform uh, when you want to work with, but that's not the only one. We do have a couple of others. Notably, we have something called Docker Swarm from the same company which has given you Docker. Uh, then we have something called Mesosphere. This is from, um, I believe, Apache. Uh, then you have, uh, I'm just putting you the names, you know, which are kind of coming off the top of my head. We have something called OpenShift, very, very popular. Uh, this is originally from Red Hat. In fact, we do have a service which lets you run OpenShift workloads on AWS as well. So we have this uh, AWS managed OpenShift um, there as well. So these are the different platforms, right? So just wanted to make sure that you understand this, this distinction. Um, container runtimes, the softwares which you install to create containers, um, and then the container orchestration engines, which help you run, manage, orchestrate. You know, you have this deployment cycle, you have these uh, multiple versions of your applications, you have these dev, de dev test prod environments, you want to run them in parallel, which is a very basic requirement for pretty much every uh, company, every project. So that is where uh, Kubernetes and the likes would help you. Mm -hmm. Right, so that just wanted to make sure that, that everybody is on the same page when it comes to um, containers. Now, when we talk about services, now we will have this category called um, um, container services on AWS. I guess you would get the idea now that whenever we talk about any technology, we have this, um, you know, um, container services, right? So when we talk about container services, we don't, it's very important, we don't talk about runtimes we always talk about the orchestration engines. That is what AWS provides you with, okay? We don't give you the runtime. Runtime is something which you pick and choose. You can choose Docker, you can choose, again, Docker for the folks who are in Kubernetes domain would know that Docker is no longer directly supported under Kubernetes. So we have other things. So we have Cryo, ContainerD, uh, Podman is, as I said, it's, it's gaining popularity in recent times. Uh, but when we talk about container services on AWS, we are referring to container orchestration engines. And that is where we have this container services. And of course, if I talk about the two big ones, we have ECS and EKS, the two of them. So, and of course they start with, I mean, the full form is um, Elastic Container Service and Elastic Kubernetes Service. Now, the question which I would have probably is, which one you choose. And, and as Nicole mentioned that she already has multiple workloads, um, containerized workloads on-prem, right? Mm -hmm. So this is where we have this, uh, how these services have been created uh, behind the scenes. I'll just give you again, a quick background there. Uh, so you have, uh, when we started, this was, I believe, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this is um, 2014 when we first came up with the service. And this was, um, this is, I mean, ECS was created by Amazon engineers, Amazon uh, developers. So this is, let's call this as Amazon's uh, proprietary um, engine or software, right? Whatever you want to call that. So this was uh, created by Amazon in-house, and this is a proprietary software. This was 2014. And I'm not sure if you know the history, but Kubernetes was open sourced uh, in 2015. And within a span of a year or so, it became very, very popular, okay? Um, everybody wanted to use Kubernetes. Everybody was putting their workload on Kubernetes because of its capabilities. Um, I will leave it to you, look it up. Uh, there's a very interesting history between Kubernetes and there is a very popular game, You all of you might have heard of it, something called Pokemon Go, okay? <laughs> so there's a very interesting history, look it up. You can find this on, your, uh, on the internet. It's very famous, very common, so check it out. Uh, and another interesting history, not history, it's present between Kubernetes and OpenAI, <laughs> okay? So so find that out. I mean, I'm the, what I'm trying to do is trying to give you the scale at which Kubernetes is so popular, 
right? It has become so popular or sort of de facto when it comes to uh, containerized workloads. And this is where what happened, as I said, 2015 onwards, we had a lot of our customers who were um, running Kubernetes workloads on-prem. And I guess that will be the problem which Nicole would like to address as well. Uh, that if I am running Kubernetes workloads on-prem, do I have to, uh, is there a way to do a lift and shift and I keep using my Kubernetes um, defined objects? And because Kubernetes has this very standard structure of working in objects and you have these YAML files. So do I have a way of just putting them on AWS and running that with, I won't say no effort, that's like a myth. Let's put this as minimal effort, right? So very less effort and you can run those environments. You can do a lift and shift and make a few changes. And from on-prem Kubernetes, you can run this on something called EKS. And that's like was the main driver for us behind the scenes. Like, you know, we had to come up uh, with something to help our customers to solve the problems on behalf of our customers. And I think this was 2007, excuse me, 17, when, when we came up with this and EKS, as the name suggests, and I guess you would have understood this by now, is something called, let's put this as hosted um, Kubernetes on AWS, right? So you want a ready-made solution. You want something um, which is managed by AWS and you can just put your workload um, and you can use your Kubernetes for, for running your workloads. You're looking at EKS, okay? So I hope that that helps. Uh, in um, understanding what uh, ECS and EKS are. Mm -hmm. um, right, so so again, let me get, get back to Nicole. You have any questions, Nicole, before I talk about Fargate? Uh, no, I think I understood those two, but as I see that as Fargate thing, so does right. it mean it makes the life of my teams even easier than just using EKS <laughs> and ECS? Because easy is, you know, they're doing too much stuff to keep the lights on and not enough to innovate, in my opinion. So is, is this something that could, you know, give them back some time to do stuff that but actually you, is beneficial for me, not just for... <laughs> <laughs> you literally read my mind and you kind of, you know, stole words from my mouth. Let me, <laughs> let me, let me put that. So yes, Fargate is one of those services. Again, if I go back to my analogy, which I was talking about pre uh, previously, when we started with ECS in 2014, um, we first came up with this thing called um, EC2. I mean, we, we gave this name later on, but this was just ECS. What happened was, um, this was the idea that you, because when you work with ECS, essentially you are under the hood, you are using EC2 instances, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so what happened was that uh, this is what we called as, uh, give me a second, sorry. Uh, we call that EC2 mode, where you are running containerized workloads However, you are responsible for the patching and upgrades um, of your EC2 instances, right? So you needed to take care of that. Now, a lot of customers, they came back to us. Um, and as I said, this is very early uh, time in, in container world and, and in AWS world as well. They started coming back that the whole reason, you know, the what we discussed like half an hour back that we make our customers' life easier. We take away the extra headache of, uh, doing those management and maintenance and patching and upgrades. If I still have to do this when I move to AWS, what's the point, <laughs> right? That's the question for customers. Yeah. And that's when what we did, uh, again, I might be off um, about the year by a uh, year or so, we came up with this thing called Fargate mode. Uh, and as I said this, I'll put this as uh, probably 2017 or 18-ish. Uh, that was some time when we came up with that model because we got multiple feedbacks. And as you would know, um, most of our services very feedback driven, right? So when we get a feedback from our customers that, okay, can we have this? Uh, we convert that into a possible feature request. And eventually we release that in the form of a mm -hmm. uh, actual feature which our customers can use. So Fargate was very much a result of that. Uh, we got this feedback continuously from our customers that we, when we are on cloud, we don't want to have this extra headache of managing um, our servers. And more importantly, uh, when you have your EC2 instances, there was again that problem of uh, when you create a cluster, again, I'm going a bit technical here for day one, but let me just uh, put this here, that you still had to manage a lot of things. Uh, you did not have that true pay as you go model where you pay for the resources you are using. And that's where Fargate came into picture. Essentially, in a nutshell, the idea is very simple. You don't worry about the EC2 instances. You, in fact, don't even see those instances where your containers are running. 
you focus on your workloads. You focus on what is your container is going to be. You will focus how many containers you want. Do you want 5, 10, 15, 100, 1,000 containers? And which image you're going to use that um, there? And then you leave the rest to us, right? We behind the scenes, AWS has these automation done that we behind the scenes go ahead and create these, these instances. And again, there's a different technology there. We don't necessarily use EC2 there. Um, uh, but we we take care of your containers. When you say that you want 10 replicas of your uh, containers, we make sure that you have the 10 replicas, 10 healthy containers running. And you get to see that in the console. You, you look at that. And as long as you see that, you are happy as a customer because you don't have any extra headache. You're not matching anymore. Uh, you're not worried about these Linux versions or Windows versions anymore. So that's a win-win for, for yeah. both of us. That, that sounds great. That <laughs> sounds great to me. But Bye. maybe... Um, so we have now done the container. So I'm I'm convinced my container teams, they will be super happy. But then I heard also about this kind of serverless stuff. So I assume serverless doesn't mean there are no servers involved. It just means, again, I don't worry about all that involved um, you with servers. You right? nailed it, uh, Nicole. You nailed it. Because, yes, there are servers. I mean, I guess a lot of you have heard of this when you go to serverless any serverless tutorial or blog article, I guess that's typically is the first line that serverless does not mean that there are no servers, which is absolutely true. Of course, you need some form of compute to run your workloads. It has to be there somewhere, um, virtually and as well as physically. It is running in some part of the world in some physical data center. It's just that, just that as a customer, as an end user, you don't need to um, worry about that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a very important point. Uh, before we talk about it, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, just I didn't mention that point that just like you have this EC2 mode and Fargate mode in ECS, in very similar fashion, you have that in EKS as well. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few more complications when it comes to EKS, but I'm kind of keeping it simple, not going into too much of the details for day mm -hmm. one. Probably when we cover this later on uh, in our maybe architecting sessions, I'll probably give her more details. But for now, you can keep it that you have EC2 mode where you take care of the maintenance. Fargate mode where AWS takes care of that for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, so we were talking uh, about serverless there, which is probably the last point. And of course, as I said, we have um, uh, we have these Lambda. When you talk about serverless, generally Lambda is the uh, is the poster boy, as I call it, for, for AWS, you know. <laughs> we mm -hmm. always talk about Lambda, and that's where I believe it all started. Um, so Lambda is the one which takes care of compute, right? So when you want to run the compute and you want to run in such a way, let me give you some figures there. Um, in EC2 instances, when you run, it, you typically work on the hourly basis, right? So you, you have to have, let's say you pay, you run for five hours, you pay for five hours. When you want to reduce, do you want to make it to minutes, uh, Nicole, that you pay yeah. for every minute? How about every uh, second? You want to pay for every yeah. second? How about that? If I just Would need 10 seconds and just pay for 10 seconds, it sounds seconds. so much better than paying for a minute or an hour if I just okay. need 10 seconds. How Can about I make it even better for you? How about mm -hmm. I go milliseconds? Wow. That's <laughs> even better. Right. Let me, let, let, let me you know, make the calculation. This sounds really, <laughs> really good. So, so yes, uh, just for everybody's benefit, uh, to help everybody understand, Lambda is, is uh, you know, priced on a per millisecond basis, not seconds, millisecond basis. So if your application, if you have some function, you have some piece of code, uh, which is running for 10 milliseconds, you actually pay for 10 milliseconds and not a millisecond more. Um, so that's one of the most powerful features when it comes to serverless and why you know people move to serverless and in terms of cost benefit and everything else, right? This is amazing. This is, do you have any, any, can I run any use case using Lambda or are there like some really prominent examples? What is really Lambda worthy and what maybe is not so good for Lambda? I would say, yes, you can run a lot of workloads. Of course, not every single piece of workload you can move to Lambda, of course. Generally, I put it this way. Any workload which is stateless, I think we talked about that before in our um, container discussion as well. So any workload which is stateless and very importantly, the one the example which I gave before, I mean the word which I used before, uh, EDA. Any, uh, let's say you have an application uh, uh, which is doing something uh, or a microservice. Yeah. 
if you can refactor that microservice or that application in an event-driven architecture. Now, essentially, event-driven architecture is very really easy to understand. I guess a lot of you would be thinking, like, what is that? It's very simple. I'll give you like a kind of a 30 seconds overview. Um, so you have a function A, it runs, it's completed, it triggers something called B. B completed, triggers C. C completed, triggers, uh, sorry, uh, triggers D, and so on and so forth. I, you get the idea, I guess. And of course, you can have this serial execution, you have parallel execution, uh, you can have this if else constructs. So when you have this kind of a structure, when you can divide or you can refactor your application into a way that you get this event-driven architecture, Lambda generally is a very good candidate um, to run your serverless architectures. Right. So of course, we have a number of other things. I mean, Lambda is just the compute. We have a full page there. Uh, let me see if I can show this. Uh, give me one second there. Um, so if I take you to that word just to um, show you, so AWS, and if I go to this serverless page there, just for everyone's benefit, um, just to give you the, the span or the scale of what we have. You know, if you look at this, Lambda is just one of them. So we do have compute. Uh, and we have Lambda and Fargate, the two services we talked about, but we haven't talked about a number of things there. It's a pretty big, um, you know, um, landscape there. So you have Event Bridge, Step Functions, SQS is for message brokers for the folks who are who are aware of that. Um, then you have S3 to save the data. I'm, I'm assuming a lot of you would be familiar with S3 and a bunch of other services. What I would suggest is just take a look at that page, which I'm showing you on the screen at the moment. Um, you just type AWS serverless, you will get that page. Um, uh, take a look, uh, just explore. Um, of course, we can't talk much. I see Ashish is already kind of, you know, telling me to stop there. <laughs> so I guess we, that much we have, I believe. That, that's the that's challenge, Sharik. There are so many things to talk about that the time is never enough. <laughs> exactly. But, exactly. But we will share the links to the learning plans yeah. where you can dive a bit deeper. I don't say do all of the learning plan, but the introductory pieces to dive a bit deeper into the services that we just mentioned. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So Good. let me let me stop sharing, and I guess of course any questions go ahead. Um, and Ashish, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it was interesting way of putting things forward, and I, I feel people appreciate the conversation-based learning. I mm -hmm. hope everyone has enjoyed. Mm -hmm. What I have also done, I have put the link into the chat, which is for the giveaways. So in case you are into live session, please register there. And from that list, we would be choosing a giveaway. And for people who are not participating in giveaway, but just needs a book, they can check these links and these would be available for you for a further discounted prices only for the live for the first week. So anyone who want to get more inspired, these are not just technical, but they will give you more information about how the career path looks for the people. So this is just some information which I wanted to share. Also, I do not have time to talk about well-architected now, but in the next session, we will talk about well-architected and we will take a company's journey that they just migrated to cloud and how they can keep moving forward to the next section. Now, while we are here, I want to give you some more resources and we will send these links also into the chat. So Nicole has come up with a detailed list of all the compute related services and plans and all. So you should be able to go ahead and take, check that. Slides will be made available into the website. So please check there. I'm putting one more resource here in case somebody is interested. So there was some question on, hey, I do not still know what is my outpost is or how it will work. So what I have done, I have published a free Udemy training. You don't need to pay for that. That's why I'm sharing it here. So you could go here and look for a service or for a training which is called uh, in spatial infrastructure for AWS workload. So there you should be able to know when to use local zone, when you would be using a uh, edge location, when you would be using VMware on AWS. So that information should be available for you. Anyone should be able to get it. Shouldn't be a problem. It's a free link. And on the same website, I have something for you which you can download and print and keep it local is called summary cards and summary sheets. So in case you want to get a PDF version of cloud practitioner certification, you want to get for solution architect, check this link 
where you should be able to get wallpapers either you set it as a desktop wallpaper so it reminds you of all the things or you can go ahead and print it into a3 size sheet so you get the most out of it so these are just some additional resources would be there and we will put this link into the chat so that you can get the most out of that also check cloud career journeys website where we have lots of other resources also for you the book and starter kit so you should be able to add it there all right prasad you want to add something you are on mute probably all i would add is that uh, any questions feel free to ask on the linkedin group be active on yep. the linkedin group all the resources will be on the uh, web page uh, but uh, we would be sharing those links on the linkedin group too now linkedin group has a issue that it does not notifies everyone when we post so you need to be regular in checking it right it's not like a slack where we can tag at the right channel or here uh, you will have to be regular in checking it and we do not want to bombard every week with mails we will see if we can mail but there was a lot of questions about will we be you know emailed or something like that and would we be having it in a zoom link uh, and all we are doing it in a one to many fashion uh, to keep it uh, simple uh, but that adds a bit responsibility on your side to keep checking for the updates any announcements and all so as nicole said she would be sharing our resources or the learning plans of what we have covered today uh, all resources that will be sharing would be mostly free of cost that's what we are trying to do to provide resources free of cost uh, as much as possible and thank you everyone for joining it was really engaging and thanks sherik and nicole i really thanks enjoyed for richard and, and kapil also for answering all yeah. the question yeah. i'll add you into the stage so yeah there are a lot of background work which happens we are trying to manage the stage we are trying to put screen first and then add call add people there so there are a lot of things going on so i would appreciate if you show some love by reaching out to these people on linkedin and thank them for the service obviously we all are having our own responsibilities on the weekend but we want to ensure that people get most out of the sessions we deliver and mm -hmm. feedback is very important if you feel we can do anything better something you like something you did not like we are always receptive to feedback it doesn't mean we would be able to act on every single feedback but we'll try to accommodate as much as we can so so that feedback is very very important one and, other thing i would say oh, it's, sorry, it's, it's, is it's, that feel free to even like uh, post about the besa group on uh, uh, linkedin and whatever you are learning learn in public uh, the behavioral track session topic today was learn and be curious we will not be having time so i'll talk it on the next but it's all about if possible learn in public it's going to help you uh, get the visibility that you should be having and it's going to build your brand exactly and i i want to make everyone's commitment again here so please type everyone that i will join next 12 next remaining 11 sessions i need your commitment obviously that keeps us on our toes so that we can add more content and we can be uh, coming up with more ideas and giving you the share also let us know how you like this format of discussion rather than a powerpoint we thought let's put a boardroom discussion in front of you and let you realize that how you would be framing answer as a consultant shari and nicole you did a wonderful job in post situation acting as a customer acting as a aws employee so obviously that helps us and that has given it so next week we would have more people richard is presenting next week i guess nicole is there so we would have people coming in and they would share their own perspective we have more volunteers who would help us with these type of discussion so we need your commitment also when we are investing our time we would expect that people get the most out of it obviously we are not getting any financial benefit but we want to ensure that the effort do not get wasted everyone's time is important and we would appreciate if you share it with your group anything you liked on youtube you can take a screenshot put it on to your linkedin channel put it on social media tag us there so that more people will get benefited more the merrier as much we can spread to the people that would be more helpful to everyone and as prasad said learn in public you like something share it on linkedin it gives you visibility that you are making continuous effort to learn something so please make sure you are consistent in your efforts any last words anyone I know we are 15 minutes beyond the time, but I appreciate everyone sticking with us. We will try to be a little more mindful from the next time, and we will start the well-architected and behavioral track from the next time. Thank you so uh, I, much, Reese. Go ahead, sir. I guess you, uh, Nicole, and I are the culprits for that. We try to keep it to a minimum, yeah. but but it's just so interesting to talk. You know, when we went through this uh, role-play model, 
it was just you know keep on talking and talking when i saw ashish then i realized i have i have exceeded <laughs> we just so ignored fine. whatever it happens <laughs> this is what happens every time with me also <laughs> right, so right. I, i'll give you perspective on that sharik mm-hmm. so when i delivered my first training on aws i finished it within time okay. but over a period of time i acquired more information right Nice. and that was the impulse that okay i know this let me share this too i know mm-hmm. this let me share this too so that obviously sure. happened nothing right. bad on that anything technical coming up anything which yeah. is coming from experience that is more than welcome richard yeah. do you agree to that right uh, it's it, it's harder and harder to stay on time the exactly. more you need to <laughs> yeah. and i and i actually i just wanted to say thanks everybody for your questions they were really really good questions i really enjoyed answering them so they yeah, keep them coming through the next sessions and i think someone All asking right. link for the homework uh, we will be posting that on the linkedin group linkedin group uh, mm-hmm. yeah so, so, so just for everyone's, everyone's perspective prasad and ashish uh, where are we putting all the links is it on linkedin group is it on besa main channel or youtube so so permanently it will be on to besa page but okay. once we make that page active we will put it on linkedin so that everyone knows that okay this is the page where i can go and find out but obviously mm-hmm. linkedin messages will not be visible to everyone so we would put it on to the website permanently and we'll announce about it into the linkedin group okay so for the time being it is going to be on linkedin but eventually it's all going to be there on besa uh, no, main no, I, i'll rephrase it so we Sorry. will first put it on to a web page on besa website and give okay. the link of that web page into the linkedin group ah okay makes sense all right makes sense okay good thank you learned a lot thank you so much and we will see you next week any feedback any suggestions any questions let us know have a good one everyone thank you everyone Last thank you thank everyone week. for signing up i have seen lot of people signing up for the free giveaway uh, in next couple of days so we will be selecting 10 people randomly uh, for the wisla yeah. uh, access and one people for ebook and we will be mailing them and the wiz lab thing is good so if you are into the draw then you can get lucky and get selected for that and there is no um, partial bias is happening there we randomly pick up people from a excel sheet so we will try to make it as generic and if you win was one time if second time again you get lucky we may have to remove your name because we want to make more people be aware available for this thing so make sure you put your information and we will see you all the next time thank you everyone thank you thank you, thank you. bye, bye. Bye-bye.